So today I want to talk about leakage. Now, I do have another video out there talking about kind of what leakage is and, and whatnot. Um, this is going to be a more long-winded lecture about, you know, various points of, of leakage that I don't think we're really thinking about right now and how we could be doing things better. I, you know, I, because I think we're just not measuring leakage very well right now. <laughs> So, you know, real quick, you know, leakage is this concept that if you protect a bunch of trees, bad guys may go next door and cut trees down. So it's the concept that, like, you know, if you're, your project might not be doing as much as you think that it's doing because people deforested somewhere else, right? Um, so I want to touch on maybe three large topics not necessarily related to each other. The first one that I want to talk about is actually a, a pretty happy topic. I call it inverse leakage. Uh, this is basically the concept of instead of causing somebody to go next door and cut trees down, you're causing somebody to go next door and plant trees. And I think a lot of carbon projects out there today are actually responsible for inverse leakage. That is to say, they're responsible for trees next door either being planted or preserved outside of the project, and they're not getting credits for this. So, uh, the le inverse leakage can happen in a lot of different ways. The most obvious cases are with reforestation projects, so ARR projects. Now, one way that this can happen is just with market leakage. Reforestation projects, a lot of them have a timber component. So you're planting trees and then harvesting some portion of those trees for timber. Well, if you're putting timber onto the market, then you're lowering the value of timber and making it so that people don't want to cut down everywhere else. Now, you know, the second fairly obvious case for reforestation is that a lot of the time when you're reforesting an area, what you're doing is you're creating a seed source. You're making it so that you're, you're growing full-grown trees that can then spread. And a lot of reforestation projects really seem to be, uh, you know, basically doing this. It happens most, I think, in mangrove projects, because mangroves in particular, once they're established, they can spread like wildfire outside the project area. So it's, it's not uncommon for a, a full-grown, well-developed reforestation project to be responsible for reforesting other areas. And, you know, I don't want to understate just how impactful this can be. Let's take a mangrove project, for example. Here, here's one example. If the mangroves that you've planted have just kind of stretched out by about 30 meters, you know, they've, they've sent out their roots and they've dropped seeds down and they've kind of expanded the project border by about 30 meters, that little 30 meter expansion can often result in something like 30 to 40 percent more carbon. And you might think, you know, when this happens, those mangroves are probably going to cut, cut down, but that doesn't really seem to be the case. Because a lot of the time when, when trees are seeding in, they're seeding into areas that people, you know, aren't really caring about, or they're seeding so close to the project that people kind of think that they're part of the project. So I really do think that there's quite a few reforestation projects out there that are basically reforesting a lot more land than they're getting credits for. You know, another, another phenomenon that I think might be happening is basically a change in attitude in the region. Now, I've observed a couple of major reforestation projects that are, you know, these massive efforts involving tens of thousands of people uh, that are really convincing communities of the benefits of tree cover. You know, they're convincing farmers that having windbreaks are good. They're convincing people to plant food trees. And it's, it's kind of a community level shift. And this goes hand in hand with the fact that when you've got a massive project that's establishing infrastructure to plant, you know, thousands of hectares of trees, uh, that infrastructure usually sticks around. So, you know, you've created all of these greenhouses and, and you've, you know, created this massive, like, s supply chain to, like, basically plant trees. Uh, that's going to continue to happen even after you've planted the trees inside the project because, you know, you've created this whole, this whole infrastructure system. And so I really do think I can point to a couple of instances in which the community mindset as a whole in the regions in which these projects are taking place have just shifted towards, you know, planting more trees in general. Uh, you know, another, another interesting case study for reforestation that I came across recently was one of funding sources. So this was a case in which, you know, people were trying to re reforest this area for decades and they've been getting little bits of funding, you know, piece by piece. Uh, and so they've, they've been getting a little bit of grant funding, but they hadn't been terribly successful. Well, the project comes along and, and handles all of the reforestation in this area now. Uh, but guess what? I mean, they can still get the same grant funding to reforest areas outside the project. So, you know, if you're getting like a continuous small supply of grants and then all of a sudden you're, you're taking care of a, like a huge area with the project, you can start applying that grant money to other places. So in all of those ways, I think reforestation projects are often responsible for sequestering a lot more carbon than we're counting them for. Now, what about other project types? 
for avoided deforestation, I do think that you can make the case that some of them might be protecting land outside of their area. So for example, uh, this is a project that takes place next to a national park. It's possible that that national park was going to be poached. You know, maybe tree poachers would have gone in and taken the most valuable trees. But now they have to go through the project. And the project does include a whole bunch of security. They've got 24-7 monitoring. They've got people who run around in trucks. So that makes it that much more difficult for them. You know, outside of parks, I would guess that some avoided deforestation projects on the edges of the Amazon are also kind of disincentivizing people from going deeper into the Amazon by being a, a moat, a geographic buffer. But I don't really have any strong evidence for this, uh, and it's just as hard to kind of figure this out as it is any other type of leakage. So that's avoided deforestation. The last project type, of course, is IFM, Improved Forest Management. Um, I have not been able to think of in any way in which improved forest management could cause inverse leakage. I don't necessarily see, you know, neighboring uh, landowners like protecting their forest because the guy next door did. Um, I get, maybe it's possible, you know, through like the change of attitude that I mentioned earlier, but I, I don't necessarily see the same clear cut mechanisms that I do for, for uh, reforestation and avoided deforestation. So that's inverse leakage. And I always try to highlight it whenever I'm reviewing a project. Um, I, I'm very glad that nobody's receiving credits for inverse leakage because it would be ridiculous if we tried to actually quantify it, but it's something worth keeping in mind. If you're looking at a mangrove project and inexplicably there's way more mangroves outside the project than there was when it started, you've probably got inverse leakage. So that's the happy leakage case, but I, I want to talk more in depth about our notion of geographic leakage to begin with, because geographic leakage is in direct conflict with additionality. The two are the same thing. And what I mean by that is if you can prove to me that somebody went next door and cut a tree down, then what you're proving to me is 100% that you're actually protecting the tree that you say you're protecting. So the two actually do go hand in hand. And if you're telling me that, you know, the project should receive fewer credits because the tree next door is getting cut down, uh, I'm, I'm going to fight with you about it because, you know, this is really just proof to me that this project needed to exist. So, you know, again and again, when I see projects taking place in regions in which deforestation rates are going up, my first thought is, this is really great, we need to protect these areas. My first thought is not, oh, this project has caused leakage. And, and the same goes for the other way around. When I'm seeing projects that are taking place in areas in which deforestation is going down, my first thought is, okay, there's some sort of change in attitude here. This project maybe isn't as necessary as people think. And this gets to my bigger point, which is that macroeconomics have a much larger role in regional deforestation rates than the fact that some carbon project exists. You know, macroeconomics causes, you know, the prices of timber, global pandemics, politics, the value of, you know, other land use scenarios, political strife, these are all reasons why deforestation rates in regions go up or down. I have never seen a case in which regional deforestation rates are in any way tied to an actual carbon project. And I think it's just overwhelmingly vain for, for the carbon world to think that like protecting this little 50,000 hectare area has had any impact at all on like Brazilian deforestation rates. Brazilian deforestation rates are driven by Brazilian politics, right? So we have a new president in Brazil right now. Deforestation rates are hovering up, but they're going to drop down once he starts enforcing the laws again. Um, and so this gets to a new point that I want to make, which is that I talked about inverse leakage just a second ago, but there's actually kind of another type of leakage called reverse leakage. And reverse leakage, this is not a term that was coined by me. It was coined like decades ago. Uh, this is the idea that if you're protecting an area, bad guys are going to cut all the trees down around that area no matter what. So, for example, this is a project that, you know, started in the 90s. It's not a carbon project. It's a forest conservation project. And it's been entirely deforested on all sides, right? Is this project guilty of 100% leakage? Should this project be receiving no credits at all because deforestation rates skyrocketed after it started? Officers, arrest these men! Wait, wait! No, obviously not. Obviously, deforestation in this area had almost nothing to do with the fact that this, this land was being conserved. It had to do with the politics of that country, right? But, you know, we're treating it as if it does. And that's really pretty stupid because we have to think of deforestation from other people's perspectives. Let's first think of deforestation in terms of the perspective of the logger. You're going around and you're logging trees, you're, you're clocking in nine to five, 
you hit a fence and you're going to go next door, okay? You're not going to work more hours. You're not going to work less hours. You're just going to go next door and cut the next tree and set of trees down. 30 years from now, all of the trees on the landscape are going to be cut down. A deep, a deep concept that we have to kind of come to terms with is that all forests that are not protected are going to get cut. And this has happened over and over again for centuries throughout human development. So 30 years from now, it's not going to matter whether or not this logger went next door this week in, as opposed to next week. And, and this brings me to my next point, which is that geographic leakage is only a temporary phenomenon. Geographic leakage is just somebody going next door and cutting down a tree maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year before they would have anyway. And so, you know, we should not be taking like full deductions for geographic leakage when it happens. So if we really do think that geographic leakage is happening, we should only be measuring how soon those trees were cut down as opposed to when they would have otherwise been cut down. We need to shift the whole conversation away from whether or not somebody cut trees down next door to how much sooner did they cut trees down next door because they were gonna cut those trees down next door. And if we start thinking of it that way, we can start quantifying it and start saying, well, the trees next door were cut down two years earlier than they would have been thanks to the project. And guess what? We actually do have a scientific way of computing what the value of carbon is put into the atmosphere for a short period of time. We can actually say if carbon was put into the atmosphere two years before it was actually going to be put in the atmosphere, this is the long-term consequence. This is the 100-year outcome. This is called the 10-year approach. And I've made whole separate videos on that because the fact is leakage is a de deeply temporal phenomenon. It only occurs for a short period of time and then all the trees are gone. <laughs> so what we should potentially be doing is deducting the 10-year equivalent of, of whatever leakage we observe outside the project for, you know, two years, five years, whatever it happens to be. And this is a concept, once again, this is a concept called reverse leakage, and it's, it's not actually a new concept. I mean, it's, it was floated around 30 years ago when people were first actually creating the protocols to begin with. But maybe it was a little too heady for people and they wanted something a little bit more simplistic. I gotta tell you, what we do now with leakage is entirely dumb. It's usually entirely arbitrary. You know, a lot of the times there's just numbers put into the, the methodologies that are just kind of pulled out of thin air. Uh, this at least would be a scientific approach to dealing with the problem.